At times, we all feel lost in search of something more. This is Christina Dam, and this is the Liberate the Podcast, a podcast designed to help inspire and guide you forward through everything spirituality, creativity, art, and just giving you a sense of empowerment so that you can be powerful, be magical, and be free. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Liberate the Podcast. Today, our guest is Kelly Fabiano, and she is the founder of Life and Death with Kelly. She is a life coach and death doula. And we're going to discover a little bit more about what Kelly does and what that exactly means while also examining and exploring the topic of reimagining what motherhood means to us. So thank you so much, Kelly, for joining today. How are Thank you? you? Thank I'm you. I'm good. Thank you for having me. How are you doing? We're. I'm doing great. It's, it's a beautiful day. I'm kind of happy that we're doing the podcast remote because when we do the podcast lately, we uh, do it outside in the garden area and it's like 100 degrees in Sherman Oaks right now. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, oh, this is good. I'm in the AC. It feels great. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't sound like fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Kelly, um, you know, death doula. I think that that's something that I don't think I've ever interviewed a death doula. You know, I've interviewed doulas before. So I kind of get the, the, the gist about, you know, a lot of our viewers, like, what is it exactly that you do, you know, and maybe a little bit of your story and background of how you ended up in, in the career choices that you're in right now. Sure. Um, so death doulas in general, provide uh, non-medical holistic support to the dying and their care community. Mm -hmm. So that can be anything from uh, like creating legacy work. Maybe they want to leave behind a recipe book for their children or um, uh, a book, an actual book, or there's um, a woman, there's a documentary. I wish I could remember the title of this woman who was dying and she uh, choreographed an entire water ballet. Um, And then after she had died, the whole town put it on and it was just beautiful. So some focus on legacy work, some, um, doulas do respite care. So they provide respite to the caregivers who usually are the loved ones, um, living in the home with the person that's dying when they go on hospice or something like that. Okay. Um, it can really be anything. Some are doing after, um, after death care or home funeral facilitation, I primarily like to um, hold space for the dying and their loved ones. So just work through, coach on anything that they might be going through, hold a space for them uh, to process what's happening and also do some advanced planning. Um, Mm. I like to work with them on, uh, I like to, I've noticed that my kind of where I've fallen into it. And the, so I went, uh, to school, um, with, uh, going with grace is where I trained okay. and a Lua Arthur in Los Angeles is the founder of going with grace. Okay. Um, and oh my gosh, I totally lost track of my thought there. You were oh saying God. what oh. you found yourself into is like your yes. kind of niche. Yeah. So she was saying that you, the things that you might be resistant to are the things that you're good at, but you, you don't want to bring that into death care. And one of the things I'm really good at is organization. I'm very type a, Okay. and I found that the clients that kind of gravitate to me are the ones who need some organization and for Mm. me to liaise between the medical team and the family. So figuring out what your benefits are with that hospice and organizing your respite and all of that, um, all of the very, the stuff I said, I didn't want to do, but I love doing, I think it's, I think it's put into a different perspective when you're doing something you love, you can bring in those qualities, um, without it feeling, I don't know, super sterile, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. No, no, it makes perfect <laughs> sense. So, you know, to, if, if I have this right to summarize for everybody, it's, you know, just kind of how a doula for birth is when most people have hear, heard of a doula. It's like, you know, uh, when somebody's about to give birth and they work with a doula for natural pregnancies or to help with that transition into parenthood. And so you're the support uh, for 
the family and also the the individual during anything that has to do with the dying and the transition. Correct. Yeah. Okay. That's pretty spot on. <laughs> and, and, and with that, I mean, I always find it fascinating how people end up choosing what they choose, right? You know, so it, even to go into studying at the Institute of Dying with Grace, you know, and uh, having a calling towards this, did you have something in your life like a death of a loved one or a family member that maybe things weren't as supportive or there was things that were a lot of loose ends that you felt that maybe you and your family or you could have used some additional answers or care, you know? Yeah, I think the most powerful death that I experienced was the death of my father. Okay. And how how old were you at that time? uh, I was 27 or 28. Okay. Um, And I found it, I mean, looking back, it's remarkable because he was on hospice. He was literally delivered to our front door on a gurney from an ambulance, right? And put in the downstairs office, we had turned it into uh, like a in-home hospital situation. He had a hospital bed, so not even his regular bed. It was a two-story house that they lived in. He was not in the bed that he shared with his wife. He was downstairs in an office, right? So you have on all this medical equipment, Yeah. yet we didn't talk about it. We, mm-hmm. we even at, there was one point where, um, I said, it's not like you're dying to my dad. Well, that's exactly what he was doing. <laughs> yeah. But it was like, you couldn't, it was something you can talk about. And so that, that piece really resonated with me, but also the palpable fear that I could feel my dad was so consumed with what was about to happen. He had no idea what to feel or, and couldn't express it to us at all. Mm. And I would have given anything to have provided him with a safe outlet because Mm. it wasn't going to be us. It, he was very much like masculine energy. You don't talk about that stuff with your family. I got to take care of my kids. I can't talk about this with my wife, but if he had a if he had a, you, <laughs> if, he, if he had, if he had a, a death doula there to hold the space, so you can be mad, you can be ready, you can be not ready, you can feel resentment, you can feel whatever you want to feel, and I'm going to hold that with you, and wow. and allow you to have some agency in your own death. I just think that. I think that's the part that really strikes a chord with me. I think that the dying deserve as much agency as possible when it comes to their death. Yeah. And and, and the family, like you said, that you didn't even talk about it to your mom or anything like that. You even said to him, it's not like you're dying when, you know, that's what he was doing, you know, Mm -hmm. like he was on hospice, you know, but it's, it's this subject that is kind of the most hush, hush, not talked about, not wanting to look at because, you know, it is arguably the biggest fear. I mean, some people say the fear of public speaking is larger than the fear of death, but I don't think if you actually put push to shove, I think that that's under, uh, you know, a a verbal, uh, you know, survey that the people aren't facing death and they might've been facing public speaking. So they rank it a little bit higher, but the reality is it's something that, is the unknown. There's so much fear around it. There isn't any discussion. Most of the people just don't even want to talk about it. They don't want to acknowledge it. There's Mm -hmm. so much that needs to be organized as far as details. But if you're not in a place, whether it's wills, whether it's these, your care, like, I mean, you just even said about what are the benefits of some of the care facilities that you're using, because a lot of people don't even know they're like, they don't even want to read that contract. They don't even want to take it in. And if, even if they do read it, how much information are they retaining? If this is something that they're in a deep state of grief, right? Right. Right. And you're also in survival mode. The, The caregivers are because 
you're and and you're you're it, it yeah you're just trying to get through it without admitting that you want to get through it because getting through it is saying I want you to go like I want this yeah. to be over so that I can get yeah. out of this uncomfortable state and it's just it's all of the things it's really it's such a nuanced situation <laughs> Yeah. No, is it is it challenging being being in that position and having having people transition while you're you're working with them? Or do you have a pretty good relationship with the afterlife or the beyond? You know, I don't I'm I think that my relationship with what happens after we die is constantly evolving and changing. And um I love I just love holding that space. And, Mm -hmm. and I think that's how, that's why I knew that I was meant for this work. And it was what I needed to do because not a lot of people feel that way, you know, because most people are the ostrich sticking their head in the sand. I mean, if you're, if, if you can pull probably out a hundred people, like more than (laughs) 75% of them don't even want to look at it. Probably more than like, I don't even know how many people over. I, I, I had one of my friends was in, in, or a colleague in a CEO group uh, created a company to help people design wills, but you'd be amazed at how many people over 60 don't have a will. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. or, and, and so they don't even want to plan for it. <laughs> no. Yeah. Right. It's, it's going to happen to everyone. And yeah. so I would just say, I mean, I, I got so much freedom and so much license to truly live my life. Once I faced the reality that it was finite. Yeah. As soon as I did some of the work, so in, in going with grace in that coursework, a big part of it is doing your own work, facing yeah. your own death, um, exploring what a good death means to you. I was terrified of dying. It would keep me up mm-hmm. at night. Um, that, Oh, what if tonight's the night? What if I don't wake up, you know, um, for like, and, and I, I would say, more than average fear, higher than average fear. Mm. Um, and doing this work allowed me to really, I mean, it allowed me to get into coaching. It allowed me to get into death doula work. It allowed me to leave my nine to five corporate gig. Um, and it allowed you to heal that fear. It sounds like. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. One of the biggest things. And as you said, to live life more freely and really embrace I think once you face any fears, you know, I work with people all the time. And once they face those fears and they really like face them head on, whatever they may be, they start to realize that they don't need to have control or impact on their life and they can just be their self. And that, you know, that opens the door to so many different possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. It's exciting. Wow. That's and it's beautiful. stretchy, <laughs> but it's, it's beautiful. And I, and, and I also, want to note how much I love the fact that you also assist in people leaving that legacy or those Mm -hmm. memorable impact on whether it's their community or their family or or even just an accomplishment that they wanted to do before Um, you know so I think that 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 is truly remarkable that's like helping also facilitate that like like those last wishes yeah yeah it's a real gift I mean it's I I feel like it may be more of a gift for me than my clients. <laughs> um, I'm sure you both are benefiting and all of their family and extended network that get to benefit from the work that you do. Thank you. And, you know, so switching topics a little bit onto, <laughs> from death to motherhood. Okay. So you go from death to new life. <laughs> I mean, sometimes they're kind of the same, like motherhood can feel like a death sometimes, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, for a lot of people, especially if it's their first child or the first child in a long time, right. You know, people have it where, okay, the kids are already teenagers and they have another round of kids or another child. And suddenly they're like, oh no, what did I do? You know, I was, I, I was almost done with all of this. Right. Oh gosh. I love that. 
<laughs> oh, so, you know, let's talk a little bit about, you know, you picked the topic, you know, uh, reimagining what motherhood means to us. And what do you exactly mean by that? Yeah. So I just, I noticed as a mom of two young children myself, I had, even though I was keenly aware of, and I joke about this with friends and family. Like I, I was the person that watched the virgin suicides and the hours and read Sylvia Plath. And I was so convinced that I was never going to let a man partner or kids crush my soul. I was going to always be me and no one was taking me down. Right. And especially the impact. (laughs) Yeah. And then, you know, especially like with, with a movie like the hours, right. It's, Mm -hmm. it's, have you seen it? No, I know of it though. It's so depressing. Okay. (laughs) And it's one of my favorites. Um, but it just centers around three different generations of women who are so boxed in both with their sexuality and also fate, you know, in motherhood and wifehood and all of the, Mm -hmm. all of it, um, that it doesn't go well for them. It ends. There's there's suicide. There's, there's a lot. It's a, it's a really heavy movie that I watched way too young. Um, (laughs) and I get all of that to say, I was so keenly aware of what I didn't want to happen to me, Mm -hmm. but I found myself after the birth of my second son, about three and a half months in, I was nearly, I, I had suicidal ideation. Mm. I was having constant panic attacks and I had completely lost. I had lost all of me. It felt Mm. like there was very little of me left. I had no idea what I wanted or needed or who I was anymore. Wow. And which I think a lot of people can relate, you know, one is there's hormonal changes that happen, Mm -hmm. you know, so Mm -hmm. that can't be negated and that feels real. I mean, even if people aren't, um, mothers, they can relate to the shifts in moods that happen during their menstruation cycle. Like, you know, the hormones affect moods. Now imagine that on, on, you know, tenfold, right. But then also suddenly everything is circled around, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, the couple months leading up the uncomfortableness circled around like this baby trying to, you can't even sit or sleep, you know, all of the things, but then you can't sleep. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's uh, needs, needs, needs impacting you. And you said you have one that's just a few years older, right? Yep. So then that one's running at to you, this new one, you know, so what happened? How, how did you, how did you shift some of that for yourself? Yeah, well, I think you you hit a really important part that I I, I want to make sure that I stress or that I don't completely brush past, and that's that I needed outside treatment. Mm-hmm. So I I ended up um, receiving outside treatment, medical mental health treatment. Okay. Um, before I started working with a life coach and doing all of that stuff, I needed to make sure I was safe. You enjoying this so far? Did you forget to subscribe? Make sure to do so. It takes two seconds. Press that little button, the red one, you know, the one, just press it little like, all right, enjoy the rest of this content. Yeah. Um, and, you, and you needed, you know, those chemical hormones probably rechecked and balanced, you know, yeah. maybe some SSRIs, you know, there's nothing wrong with the needing a little support when things it's, it's when in society, we rely too much on it as a crutch, but when there's real things that are happening And Mm -hmm. there's chemical imbalances. That's the beauty of the advancement of technology is that we don't have to suffer. It's just like, you know, if we have if you have a really bad, you know, pain in your body uh, or a headache and you take two Tylenol, you don't have to suffer through the day. Now, if you take Tylenol every single day just because, you you know, there might be a little bit of a problem. Maybe there's something else you can take or do that could be more supportive for a healthier life decision, you know, but yeah. 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 And I'm, I believe I did need to take. Yeah. No, and a lot of people. Yeah, a lot of people do. And there's nothing wrong with that. Even though, like, I know a lot of people look at, 
at uh, be at Liberate or a lot of the healers or practitioners is completely alternative health, but there's a place for everything and in balance, mm-hmm. you know, by all means, Absolutely. if immediate intervention is going to keep somebody from trying to commit suicide or to get out of that misery so that you can rebalance and mm-hmm. then think clearly and then take those steps. That's, that's perfectly fine. People don't, don't think that you need to do everything on your own or the hard way there. You can do things and get assistance and then also seek of what other things can support like life coaching and other, you know, healing yeah. modalities that can support you. Exactly. And I did, I, I, um, it felt like I, I was, I'm grateful that the point I was at such a rock bottom that the, there was no fight when it was like, okay, you need to, you actually are going to need to go on medication. Mm -hmm. Um, it was okay. Well, I don't want to die. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Um, so that was definitely part of the journey and it was a necessary part. I don't, I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't be here without it. I know that. Um, and then the other piece was I had this, I had formed this baseline for survival, Mm -hmm. but that I was able to step outside of all of that and realize, well, that's not enough. Yeah. I don't want to just survive my life. I want to live it. And so that's when I started to get into other, um, other practices like meditation and yoga and sound baths and really just like enjoying all the juiciness. Right. And, and then I found a life coach through a breathwork circle and she just spoke my language. She, she just got me. And so I, I started working with her to kind of piece back all of the parts I discarded and embrace the new pieces of me because Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think motherhood is an enhancement to who we are. It's not a replacement for who we were. Mm. Um, which is why I I have my program is called mom life reimagined because it's about making motherhood fit who you are and not the other way around. Yeah. Um, Which is, which is beautiful because I think so many people think that, okay, once I'm a mother now, I, it's my old life is gone. Yeah. Yeah. Or there's so much societal pressure that I mean, I think people get into, and it's really beautiful, but they get into these mommy and me clicks and these other people. And then like, suddenly they, they feel the pressure that this is how they have to be. And maybe mm-hmm. they don't resonate with that, or they feel that they're, they don't want to, you know, screw up their kids. So they feel that there has to be a right way and a wrong way to do everything. And yes. then there's all this pressure and, ah, you know, but the bottom line is, it's okay. You can be you. That's the individuality and the individuality of how you raise your child. Right. And that's what your program's all about. It's about keeping you with that. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm definitely not a coach that's going to teach you how to parent because I don't know how to parent your children better than you do. Mm -hmm. You are the expert in your own life. Um, but I can help you ditch all of that good mom, bad mom narrative. Mm -hmm. And I can help you form powerful boundaries and ask for help without feeling like it makes you less than, and I can help you discover what lights you up inside and go, go after those things without feeling like that makes you a bad mom. Mm -hmm. Um, so that, yeah, I'm, I'm so passionate about, I just feel like it's, this, this loss, this like loss of identity, it's sneaky. It happens gradually over time. And it is the societal pressures and gender role expectations and all of these things, just they sneak in. And then one day you wake up and you're in a box that just doesn't allow for any movement. Well, and and everything becomes, I mean, I've seen it with like, hopefully my sister doesn't watch this one, but like, (laughs) like my, my sister and her husband and their kids, like, it's like, like, they don't have an outlet other than their kids. It's like between taking them to hockey and doing other things. It's like, Mm. I mean, you know, it's, it's just their life is their children and they don't exist anymore. And I, 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 you know, sorry, (laughs) 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 Uh, but I see that so often with people is that, you know, this level of, you know, so, worried about being a good parent Mm -hmm. and doing the right thing, suddenly 
they are taken out. And that can lead to if you're not happy, if you're not feeling your well, if you're not honoring you, you know, and so that's why I love what you're doing and the program that you're offering is you're giving people a different way to reimagine what being a mother means and identifying their self, right? You know, that's kind yeah. of what it's all about. Yeah. And I just think it's, it's so necessary that when you, when you described, hopefully your sister isn't watching. <laughs> Um, but when you described that, my, my chest felt like I, I couldn't breathe for a minute. Cause I was like, Oh my God, that's so suffocating. Like it feels, but it is, it's just the norm. It's the acceptable thing to do. Yeah. It's like the, their weekends are just like, you know, and then they have two kids. So sometimes one parent has taken one to this Lit, state for yep. hockey and hockey and this and that, and th this one's getting picked up from this school and this one's getting picked up from this. And maybe they share a meal together. Maybe they don't. And then it's just the next day all over again. Yeah. That's why I, I call it the hamster wheel from hell. It's like you wake up in the morning and you're just, it's the same thing. You're getting through the day, but you're not experiencing any of it. Yeah. And so I was a good mom. I was making breakfast. I was taking to daycare. I was picking up. I was bathing. I was do. I was doing all the things, but I was miserable mm -hmm. and kids are so smart and they pick up on that energy. And like my, my oldest son, he'll be seven um, mm -hmm. soon. And he, he, he could just feel that I, I could tell, like he, he was, he's intuitive. Like he got it. And I've noticed these past few years, a shift in, in him. Mm. And, um, and it feels really good. I just, I don't know. I wish I had an answer for why. I mean, I have a, a million, I guess, answers for why this happens to us. Right. But it's mind boggling to think that we are whole human beings before we become moms. We're a whole human and mm -hmm. we decide then that we want to have a child. Mm -hmm. Why would we think that we don't, do we don't think before we can see, well, well that, that part's dead once the baby comes. So let's say, have a goodbye Kelly party because she's gone once <laughs> I have my, right. You don't, because if who would sign up for that? Yeah. You know, but, but so many people, and then you have it where, you know, a lot of people that feel the same way if like, let's, let's say they have friends that don't have kids and then friends and then the people that don't have kids have friends that ha that get ha end up having kids. They end up separating from them because all it, their whole life becomes their kids. And they're like, well, you're not you anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You've heard yeah. those, you know, like so many people are like, well, you know, what about the fact that we used to love going to art galleries together. You don't like that anymore. You, you don't like to even look yeah. at art or do this, you know, that was such a passion before you used to want to go every weekend. You don't even want to go once a month. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. And I get it. No. And, and by all means, there's time, there's different responsibilities and there's a shift that happens. But I think what you're saying is that there's a different way that you can reimagine what it means and mm -hmm. that, you can really define it differently and it doesn't have to look like the norm and you can still have yourself within this new dynamic of this new unit of familyhood. Yeah. I mean, my goal is that this norm dies off, like not the people, <laughs> but the norm and that we have a new norm of, you know, people that are allowed to take up space yeah. in their own lives. Um, yeah, I wonder and I when you say that like that, I'm just my thought, my brain went doo -doo -doo -doo, but I wonder if there's like some kind of still like residual energy from if we go back to like the 1950s and 1960s, mm -hmm. even the 70s, even even 80s, you know, it wasn't really that women started to work in the household until like the late 80s, 90s, really, you know, that it became dual income households, right? Before it was a very patriotic society and uh, the man worked, the mom stayed home and raised the kids. Yeah. And there's still because that is such a new paradigm shift of having this dual working households right in a normal heterosexual relationship. I mean, there's all different types of relationships out there now and different parenting structures and different units and households. But when you look at it like that. I think that there's still this impact of that 
residual belief system, well, all of these responsibilities now lie on the mother again. Yeah. Yeah. And before, you know, but it's like, there's so much liberation that has happened and women now have a voice and identity they always had, but now they're allowed to have it. Right. And they have careers and they have hobbies and they have passions and they have all of this other stuff that wasn't really even allowed years ago. Right. Right. And, and, and even if it was starting to be allowed, it was very abnormal to be pursued. Right. Mm-hmm. And so then you have that. So my hope is with what you're saying is that that becomes something that does shift because we are in a shifting society and there is a lot of shifts and changes that are happening, even if we might have went backwards today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I can't, I, I, I was, yeah, I, uh, don't even know how to, I was thinking about that today. Like how, how to, yeah. But with that being said, so what, what can people expect from, uh, coming to one of your programs and classes? Like the one that we're doing on July 10th here. Oh yes. Okay. So this workshop, um, so I, I offer a coaching series. That's another offering that I have where it's a private Mm -hmm. coaching series over the course of three months. And and that's for motherhood and also for death doula. No, that's just mom life. Yeah. Mom life reimagined. Okay. Um, uh, but the workshop that I, I hold is called three keys to work life self balance for exhausted moms, which is quite the mouthful. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I don't know. Um, but I, I love, I just really love this workshop. I'm so excited to bring it to your space. Um, it's, it's an opportunity for moms to really get clear on, um, what's kind of keeping them from feeling present in each aspect of their life. So work, um, home life, and also their own Mm self-care, um, and how they can implement more presence into their life. Okay. Uh, and then there's, there's opportunity for a gentle reflection. And my, the, my favorite part of this workshop is just the community that it builds The stories that are shared and the experiences that are shared are so vulnerable. And it's just so beautiful to witness all of these women come together and lean on one another. And they're all most complete strangers. It's just, it's such an incredible experience. And it's, it's also an opportunity for some really delicious self-care. Like it's just an opportunity to get loved up on and take some time and space for yourself and reflect on, you know, how to integrate more of you into your life. I love that. I do too. I can't can't wait. (laughs) And I'm sure if you're listening to this and it's already after July 10th, I'm sure that we're going to be having this program um, a few times during the year. So make sure you check on the calendar. But also we maybe maybe you'll be doing something for uh, helping people you know cope with that too in a workshop yes. on that in the near future, especially with yeah. all of the different challenges that people have had to face with uh, sudden deaths and and things that have been going on recently. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it was interesting to undergo training as a death doula during a global pandemic where yeah. you weren't even really allowed to volunteer at many of the hospices because patients yeah. didn't want volunteers coming to their homes during that time. No, so they, they want anything that could be more, you know, that could be any type of way to let in any type of contagion to be like, yeah. no, right. Yeah, which understandably, but then it, oh became, then it became a very lonely, isolated time. And then there's a lot of picking up the pieces of family members that don't know how to cope with the not being able to really say goodbye or have that space or time with their loved ones too. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, I've lost two, one colleague and one friend during the pandemic that there was no funeral because at that yeah. time there couldn't be. And so there was, you know, zoom celebration of life. And then, it's like, you know, you just, there's not that connection. 
Yeah. Um, it's, it's rough. It's rough. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be as rough with no. support from, from you, you know, Thank you. Yeah. That's my hope. <laughs> yes. For both, for hey, people, if, I mean, I think that if anybody's a, a mother, a newer mother, mother for some time, if you're listening to this and you're feeling like maybe you lost a little bit of yourself, you need some nurturing and self care, um, need to relook at how you relate with motherhood and yourself and your identity. I think, you know, whether doing some coaching with Kelly or coming to one of the workshops would be really beneficial. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Kelly, is there anything else you want to share with us before we wrap up today? I don't, I guess I would say, um, when it comes to working through stuff, uh, I get a lot of, um, objections from, so part of being an entrepreneur is having those discovery calls and getting no's, you know, yeah. and that kind of builds your resilience. And, um, but one of the most common objections I hear from moms is I'm not miserable enough. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say, you don't have to be miserable in order to take up space and let life be fun and exciting. You don't have to reach a rock bottom to deserve those things. You deserve them right now. No, it's beautiful. And if you're thinking it's not miserable enough, that means that you're probably not enjoying, you know, so, <laughs> I mean, if that's your go-to word and terminology, it probably means that you are the ideal candidate to add some joy and happiness into your life, right? That's the way we like, work. It's like, I'm I, not miserable enough. <laughs> Oh man. Well, how about if, how about to say, can, can I, can life be better than this? And if the answer mm -hmm. is yes, then why not explore it? We're in this thing, yeah. this, this meat suit, the skin suit, the spiritual thing. Maybe we do it many lifetimes. Maybe we don't, I don't care what your belief system is, but this lifetime is valuable and important. And it's also very short. So are you going to live it and be miserable most of your life or, or status quo, or even just it's okay. Or do you want it to be extraordinary? Do you want to wake up and be like, man, I love my life, you know? And if you're not waking up saying, man, I love my life, then you can change your life. And that's the beauty of it is that the empowerment starts with you. And yes, you might need support from others, whether coaches, healers, medical yeah. community if the, and, and intervention, but there is tools around you, but it starts with you making that decision and you can have that life that you wake up. It's not something that you just see in the movies. It's people live like that. You mm -hmm. know, they wake up and they're like, yeah, it's fun or this, or that problem doesn't bother me. That's a, that tells me more about you than me. Who cares? I'm moving on. I'm living in my bubble and my joy, my, my happiness. I'm doing my thing. Yeah. And so if you're not there, know that you can be there. Absolutely. It might take some work, but if you're yeah. willing to do the work, you can have the reward. Yeah. And the community. I think it's definitely something we don't need to do it alone. We, we need each other, yeah. um, but you, you deserve extraordinary. We all do. Yeah. I mean, yeah. even on the back of our bill, as much as you love or hate America now, it says life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So if you're to write, you have one of those bills in your pocket right now. I guarantee it. Just look at it. Pursuit of happiness. You're right. I love that. Not in meat suits. Oh gosh. I just, I love it. This is great. Oh, thank you so much, Kelly, for being thank you with for us. Having me. And thank you everybody for watching or listening. You're probably listening. So I invite you to go and watch on YouTube because we're really trying to build that YouTube channel. Of course, if you're listening on Spotify or iTunes, please like, comment, subscribe, all of that fun stuff. But if you go and visit our YouTube, do the same. It needs a lot of help. It's really struggling. We're trying to get it our algorithms up but you know what for whatever reason it's difficult maybe all of the censorship i have no idea but help us out so more people can find amazing content contact content con, but, 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 amazing <laughs> contacts like kelly and also um having the content to maybe open somebody's mind to the possibility of a better life thank you absolutely do it do it <laughs> come on do it. Bye now. Thank you. <laughs>
Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed this conversation, please like it, subscribe, and share it with your friends. If you want to hear more about what we have going on and happening online or in in the neighborhood, check out liberateyourself.com and sign up for our mailing list. Uh, Also, follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Liberate Yourself. It's you are self, U-R-S-E-L-F. Until next time, be powerful, be magical, and be free.